Well, today we take a, a brief hiatus from uh, the book of Acts, and we're going to be looking together at John 3. John 3, verse 16 through 18 will be uh, the subject of today's sermon. John 3, verse 16 through 18. Very well-known uh, verses from Scripture. John 3, verse 16 through 18, where God, God's Word reads as follows. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So far, the reading from God's Word this morning, may He add its blessing to our hearts. This is the time of family traditions, isn't it? Christmas time is the time where we exchange gifts and we have our snacks and we do all these extra fun things. And one of my pet peeves when it comes to the exchanging of gifts at Christmas time is that, uh, that people can take gifts for granted. And so in our family Christmas celebration, uh, we have a tradition. Uh, and it's a tradition that's enforced. It's a very subjective kind of tradition, and I'm sure it's a bit of a mystery to my children. But the tradition is one person opens a gift at a time and, and so one gift is taken out from under the tree and we give it to one of the children and, and they open it and, and, and they have to we all have to kind of generate enough kind of excitement about this one gift until my subjective sensibilities are satisfied and, and then I'll get the next present and, and we have to do that over and over again until, until everybody's had, had their turn and everybody has gotten their presents. Now I'm not sure if this, this exercise that we walk through as a family is accomplishing what I want it to accomplish. But the hope for me as a father when we give out our gifts is that we, we appreciate the gifts that we receive and that, that we value the gifts so that it is, it is precious to the person who's, who's receiving it. That, that's the goal. And that's the same goal that I, that I have for this morning as we look at this, this well-known passage of Scripture. I want us as a congregation to slow down and to focus on the gift of Christ's coming today, to, to examine it, to admire it, to, to marvel over it, to, to turn it around in our minds so that it's not something that we just read about every year and, and something that becomes flippant and something that we take for granted. And so to do that, I want to focus our attention to the central doctrine uh, of this passage of Scripture, which is that the Father's love for the world is seen in Him sending His Son and giving salvation to those who believe. And we're going to see this morning the love of God in verse 16, the salvation of the world in verses 16 through 17, and then the condemnation of the lost in verse 18. So today we want to learn that the Father's love for the world is seen in sending His Son and giving salvation to those who believe. We're going to see the love of God, the salvation of the world, and the condemnation of the lost. So let's begin by looking at the love of God together in verse 16. Today's passage is one of the great unifying texts of Scripture. Uh, it doesn't really matter which theological tradition you come from, you will hold this verse in high esteem. And uh, as I told my wife today, uh, or yesterday, that I was preaching on this passage this morning, she, said, she asked me, well, what are you going to say uh, that hasn't already been said about this passage? And the answer is nothing. There's not really anything that you can say about this passage that hasn't already been said. But in taking this text that is a great unifying text of the Christian faith, I want us to stop and marvel at something that perhaps we miss when we read this text so familiar, familiarly and so frequently. This, this whole idea at Christmas time that, that God's Son takes on human flesh, that he's, he's born of the woman, He's laid in a manger in Bethlehem, that He's born under the law. All of these things are uh, a manifestation of a gift that God gives. It says in our passage that God so loves the world that He, he gives His Son. Why does God give His Son? So that those who believe in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's the reason behind His birth. That's the reason behind His coming. He comes to provide deliverance 
for those who believe in Him. That's the, the true reason that sits behind Christmas, or it should sit behind Christmas. It's, it's the true reason, and maybe it's more faithful to say, that sits behind our celebration about the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it's, a, it's an interesting study, this, this study of the birth of Christ. It's, it's such a huge part of what people associate with Christianity these days. The, the time that people talk about Jesus the most is around Christmas time or, or maybe Easter time. And it was interesting. Uh, recently, we had our, our Cliffwood Outreach Day. And, and when we went out into the community and we, we asked people about their knowledge of the story of Christmas, it was surprising to me. Sometimes they, they didn't know many things ab about the questions we asked. For example, who, who, who Jesus' mother was or, or, or some question that, that I thought people would know. They didn't know. But almost all of them knew that Jesus was the Son of God. It was surprising that, that people who seemed ignorant about much of the Bible knew that Jesus was the Son of God. Even if there's a, an overall ignorance about the meaning for His coming, they knew who He was. And it is the meaning that we're after. We're, we're looking at the meaning as to why the Son of God came into the world. And that meaning is laid out for us here in this passage of Scripture, in John 3, verse 16 and following. And as we work our way through this passage, as we seek to learn uh, of the Father's love for the world, we want to see some other things along the way. And the first lesson that I want to point out to us that maybe we miss when we read a passage like this so frequently is that, that this passage is primarily about the love of the Father. It's not about the love of Jesus. It's about the love of the Father. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now, the father isn't mentioned by name, but it is clearly the father who is in view. The one who gives his son must be the father. There are many children in this congregation. Only some of them are my children. Only some of, some of them call me father, and I call them son or, or daughter. If, if one of your children is in the same room as, me, as I am, and, and they say, Father, I'm not going to turn and pay attention because they're not my children. The father addresses his children as son. He addresses his, his sons as son, his, his male children as sons, his female children as daughters. And so when it speaks of the son being sent into the world, then the father is the one who is in view. It's the love of the father in redemption that we're studying this morning. And it's a love that is frequently neglected. It's common to think that the Father loves you because of the sacrifice of the Son. But that's not what this passage says. This passage says, not that God loved you because of the sacrifice of the Son, but God loved you and therefore sent the Son. To speak of the love of the Father coming as a result of Jesus' work is destructive to the gospel. But to speak of the coming of Christ as a result of the Father's love for you, that is entirely faithful and entirely accurate. You see, the plan of redemption, the redemption that God works for His people, is part of the eternal decree of the Trinity. We serve a Trinitarian God. We, we worship three persons in one God. And, and this one God in, in three persons has one plan of redemption out of a, out of a love for the world. Too often we think, about, we think only about Jesus' love. But, but how often do we think about the Father's love? This, wor this verse is, is not about the work of Jesus. That will be discussed later. But this passage begins with a study of the love of the Father. So when it comes to, to Jesus' arrival... We, are, we marvel about the second person of the Trinity who is who's fully God and who takes on human flesh. And, and that is a marvel. That is something to be amazed about, to be sure. But what of the love of the Father in sending His Son, in sending His, his only begotten? Sometimes we, we don't pause and, and think of the significance of the gospel message that, that is, in a sense, uh, uh, foist it upon us at Christmas, Christmas time. It, it should interrupt our sensibilities. It should interrupt our complacency when it comes to understanding the depth of God's love for us. You see, 
this Trinitarian God that we serve, three persons, one God, there are relationships within the Trinity. And I'm not going to try to explain it beyond what Scripture can, or what Scripture gives us, because I can't. And I would only be guessing, and I would probably be corrupting a whole lot of what Scripture says. But, but we know that there are three persons in one God from Scripture, and that within this Trinitarian, relation, uh, Trinitarian relationship, there are distinct persons. And within this relationship, there are things that we can't comprehend, but they interact with each other. We know that Jesus, the Son in the flesh, prays to the Father, and that the Father hears Him. We know that the Father and the Son send the Spirit to come in the place of Christ. I don't know how that works, and I, I don't know what that means, but I know that there are three persons in the Trinity, three persons in one God, and, and these three persons interact in perfection with each other. They, they are perfectly holy, three persons, one God, perfectly righteous, without sin or without blemish, with, without impurity, without, without anything unrighteous about him, perfect in harmony, perfect in love, perfect in kindness. God is all these things perfectly. And he doesn't need you. And he doesn't need me. He doesn't need his creation because he is completely independent of, of anything and, and anybody. He doesn't need us. And to make matters worse, he he makes us and then we rebel against him. <clears throat> Almighty God, in wisdom, then sends, because of his love, a mediator to stand between himself and man. But the coming of the mediator isn't without implications. When it says that God so loved the world that he gave his son, that is not without implications. As part of his love for man, the perfect love of God, in some sense, in some sense that is incomprehensible to us, the love between father and son is interrupted. Is interrupted when Jesus Christ hangs on the cross and cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The second person of the Trinity crying out to the Father, the first person of the Trinity, for uh, the pain and anguish that he feels as the Father turns his face away from him. From the moment of Jesus' birth in the manger, that separation must have hung over him like a heavy weight. For God so loved the world that he gave his Son. Father loving the world to send the Son to die in the place of sinful, rebellious creatures. So why does God forsake the Son? He forsakes the Son because He loves the world. He, he loved the creation that rejected Him. He, he loved it so much that He purchased reconciliation for Him at a great cost. The love of our Father for His people for the world, as it's described in this passage, is great. And he purchases reconciliation at great cost. So we see the love of God. Well, next, we want to consider the salvation of the world. We, we started by saying that John 3.16 is one of the great unifying texts of the Christian faith, but then it is also one of the great dividing texts of the Christian faith. And the dispute typically revolves around what is meant by the world. And that's the second sub-lesson that we want to learn as we work our way through this passage of Scripture. Some would say that the world means everyone, that, that God loved everyone, and that there's some kind of a, a universal atonement. For those of us who are in Reformed theology, rooted and grounded in Reformed theology, we believe Scripture teaches that God only died, that Christ only died for the elect, that He died only for His people. And so God's expression of, of love is manifest in the child coming in the manger, born by the, of the Virgin Mary. But what we want to consider now is who is the object of the love of God? Is the world indeed everyone? Is the world always in Scripture a word that's described to describe all of humanity? Well, there are different ways in which the world, that word, is used in Scripture. And there are three options that I want us to consider uh, together this morning. The first one is found in Matthew 4 and verse 8. 
And then that, we see Jesus in the middle of his temptation in the wilderness by uh, the devil. And uh, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. So when Satan is tempting Jesus in the wilderness and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world, here that word world means the entire created order, the planet earth. It's a, it's a, it's a term of space, uh, the world. He shows them all the kingdoms that exist in all of, on all of the globe which we, in, we inhabit. Okay, so there's one sense in which the world can be used as the created order. Then there's another sense in which the world uh, is used quite differently, and that you can find that in John's Gospel in the 7th chapter and in the 7th verse. And there Jesus says, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it uh, that its works are evil. So Jesus testifies about the world that its works are evil. And in that sense, the world is the unregenerate. The world is uh, those who, have, uh, re who continue in rebellion against God Almighty. And, and so the world is the condition of God's creation after the fall, a, 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 a creation that is dead in its trespasses and, and sin. And so in that sense, uh, the word world is not an issue of space, as it is in Matthew's Gospel, but it's a it's a, it's a term that deals with regeneration, or lack thereof, rather. And so the world can be used to describe the created order. It can be used to describe the unregenerate. There's one more place where we can see how the world might be used. And that's also in John's Gospel, in John 12 and verse 19. And in, in John 12, verse 19, the Pharisees are complaining about the effectiveness of of Jesus' ministry, and the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And so they're describing the whole of humanity in a sense. They're saying everybody is following after uh, Jesus. You see uh, something sim similar to that in uh, John's Gospel, 14th chapter, 19th verse, where uh, Jesus is saying, yet, in a little while, yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Jesus speaking there of the mass of humanity. It's, it's not thinking of space, it's not thinking of regeneration, but it's, it's thinking of mankind in, in general. And, and the image of God imparted to all men, spread across the world, spread across the globe. That's what's in view when the world is used in, in that sense. Now, this passage is dealing with God's compassion towards mankind in general. It's not making a statement about regeneration in general, but it's making a statement about God's compassion towards all the world. He reserves a special love for his people, but God does not leave mankind without hope of salvation. He doesn't leave mankind without some sense that rescue is possible. And so it's about the great, it, this passage here is, is not about the greatness of the world, which sometimes we might think, but is about the greatness of God's love, the greatness of his compassion. God's love for his rebellious creation is, is so great that he sends the son to provide an escape. The child lying in the manger is the solution for the world. It, it's not saying that all the world will turn to this solution. But it's simply saying that the solution is made known and, and the news of it is spread across all the world. Now, we see in uh, John 3 the reason for Jesus' coming, and that's, that brings us back to the sense of the compassion of God. If you look in, in verse 17 of our passage, there John writes, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The, pur the purpose of the baby born in the manger and his eventual crucifixion and death, the purpose of Christ's coming is not to point fingers and condemn. The condemnation of man is a byproduct. It's a necessary result of the primary purpose for which Jesus comes. The child lying in the manger comes to accomplish redemption. He, he comes to to bring forgiveness, which is offered freely to the world. That's why he came. That's the, the wonder of Christmas. It's the, the free offer of salvation with, with certain promises. If you trust in Christ, you will be saved. And that's the promise that, that is offered at, at, through the gospel. 
this, this offer of salvation to the world. So that's the promise that made, made to you. It's a promise made to your children, to all who are far off, to all those whom the Lord calls. But did Jesus die for everyone? Did God love the world so that he had Christ come and, and shed his blood for everyone if only they would turn and believe? Did God send the Son into the world without a guarantee that his death would accomplish his purpose at all? Well, using the analogy of Scripture or using Scripture to understand Scripture, using Scripture to interpret Scripture, we know that that's not the case. The offer is for all, and it's sincerely made, but because of the fall, man will only choose this offer if his heart is changed by the Holy Spirit. That's what Matthew 22 would talk about when it says that many are called, but few are chosen. This whole idea of the offer of salvation made to the world, the compassion of God resting on the world, but at the same time a special love reserved for those whom he set apart. A special love reserved for those whom he had called, who, who hear the gospel message and who by the Holy Spirit's work are able to turn and, and believe. And we can understand that in our passage this morning as well by considering the condemnation of the lost as it is included in our passage. Baby Jesus in the manger, it's, it's misunderstood today. Baby Jesus in the manger has, has been turned into a cheap sentiment a silhouette of, of wise men or a silhouette of, of, of shepherds kneeling by a, a manger and something that we can, can all gather around and, and, and marvel about. Baby Jesus, meek and mild. But Jesus in the manger, without an understanding of a worship of that incarnate Son, will be the very reason for the condemnation of those who send cars with that image on it. Void of an understanding of the lordship and rule of Christ, uh, God Almighty over you, those, uh, those who refuse to believe, those who refuse to trust, they, they will not be free from condemnation. Only those who believe in Christ will be free from condemnation. And, and Paul says that in, in his letter, in Romans 8, chapter uh, chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who believe in Christ Jesus. It's not talking about those who talk about Jesus or those who make sentimental references to Jesus. No, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The world, the created order, the mass of humanity exists outside of Christ Jesus. They are only brought into Christ Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the, the, the life-giving work of, of God Almighty. And so that's why it can say in, in verse 18 of our passage, whoever believes in him is not condemned. That's what it means to be in Christ, to believe in him. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. That means that if you are living your life outside of Christ, if, if your trust and confidence is not in Christ, in this moment you have already been condemned. You have already been condemned. It's a, it's a perfect verb in the Greek language. It means that it's, it's already accomplished in a sense. Now, we can still be justified if we live in rebellion right now. But if you live in rebellion, it is as if the judgment of God rests on you already. Just in the same way that if you are in Christ... It is that the forgiveness of Christ is applied to you past, present, and future. That's what's in view here. The, the one who doesn't believe is condemned already. Why? He's condemned because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. Well, what is the name of the Son of God? There's a beautiful passage in Isaiah. It's in Handel's Messiah. Talking about the name of Jesus. Isaiah 9, verse 6 and following, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. 
That's who's in the manger. That's who's in the manger in, in Bethlehem. The creator of heaven and earth. The one who is to be worshipped and adored by you for all your days. If you're not trusting in him to rescue you from the guilt of your sin, John's gospel teaches us that you stand condemned. Now, I don't, I don't mean to be overly negative. I get, I get accused of being a, a Grinch sometimes. And I'm not really, I don't think, well, well enough people say it, so maybe it's true. But, but at Christmas, if you only view Christmas as an opportunity to be sentimental. If you, if you only view Christmas as an opportunity to come together with, with family and, and have, a, have a nice meal, then you have not grasped the love of the Father for you in sending the Son. That's the reality of this passage. That's what it's teaching us. The Father has looked at the rebellious world that He made, but He has looked upon it with love. He sends His Son into the world to, to bear the curse of the sins of those who believe in Him. But for those who do not look to Him for deliverance, only one thing remains, and that is con condemnation. And so as a congregation, as we consider the love of God, the salvation of the world, and the condemnation of the lost, I want us to think about the gospel according to Christmas. It is not wrong to rejoice about the Savior's birth. That's not what I'm saying. I hope you're not hearing me saying that. Because many people in Scripture rejoice about the birth of the Son. There are the angels, first of all, in, in Luke 2, verse 14, who rejoice over the peace that God brings to those with whom He is pleased. Or you see Simeon in the temple who cries out with joy, My eyes have seen your salvation in Luke 2 and verse 30. Or Anna at the same time in the temple who is speaking to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. All of them rejoice over the coming, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the amazing thing is that in reality, the birth of Jesus receives very little attention in Scripture. We have four Gospels about the life of Jesus. Only two of them record the birth of Jesus. That doesn't mean that we don't celebrate His birth, but we celebrate His birth not for the sake of His birth. We celebrate His birth because it is a manifestation of the love of God in bringing redemption to the world. You see, the Father... The Father is not content to let you languish in condemnation. But He provides you with a way of salvation. And He says, trust in Christ. The Son of God. He took on human flesh. And He, be, he became a man. He was, he was born by the Virgin Mary. He lived as a true and real man. He, he's like you in every way except for one. He's like you in every way except he has no sin. But he had a real body and he had a real soul. And he was like that so that he could stand in your place. He was like that so that he could take the punishment that you deserve. He was like that so that the wrath of God would be poured out on him instead of on you. He became like that so that he could be your eternal mediator. He came as that child born in Bethlehem so that he could endure the cross of Calvary. He received gifts as a child from wise men so that he could endure God's wrath as he died. There's that, that Christmas hymn, Joy to the World, the Lord is Come. It's a song that's, that's filled with, with truth. But when you sing that song, do you mean what you sing? Do you mean that earth received her king? Or is it just a song that you sing? Do you take God's name in vain, in a sense, when you sing that song because there's no meaning behind it? Because it's just, it's just a song that you're supposed to sing because it's Christmas time. See, our passage teaches us that God so loved his creation that he gave his son to be a sacrifice, to be the object of the deliverance of his people. Now, you can... Treat them as a trinket, if you like. And you can use them as a rallying point for sentimentality or family, if you like. But God sent him into the world that you would believe in his name, that you would stand in awe of him, and that you would worship him, 
that you would know him as the wonderful counselor, that you would kneel before him as almighty God, that you would turn yourself to your everlasting father so that in his arms you would find eternal peace. Let's pray together.